I'm ready for some fire. How are we all doing this morning? I got to make some room. I like to spread out. Glory, glory. Uh, just want to just say thank you for allowing me to be here this morning to share the word of God with you. Um, the title message is uh, Passion in Your Pursuit. You know, and I, I really just, I just, I, I believe that God has sent me to, to talk to some broken people. I believe that God has trained me and equipped me and sent me into the body of Christ to talk to broken people. Is there any broken people in here tonight? How many of you know the Bible says that God is closest to those who are of a broken and contrite spirit? See, if you want to walk in victory, you got to have, you got to be broken. See, I, I, what, what, I, what the Lord sent me here to tell you this morning is he wants you to have passion in your pursuit. Because, see, the church in, in America has, has, lo- has left its first love. You know, we've gotten complacent and content with just religion. We've gotten content and complacent with just with the status quo and, and, and the same old, same old. But, I, I, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm hungry. I, I got to have something more. I got to have something greater than myself that can help me live this life out every day in total victory so that when I go out there, I can shine the light of the glorious gospel to to the entire world and set the captives free. There's no greater joy for me than to step out there and be able to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. It's no greater joy for me to go out there and be able to, to preach to somebody and tell them that Jesus loves them and see their lives change from the inside out. See, I don't rule, I don't live my life being ruled by external circumstances. I live my life by faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone on the inside. Amen. Well, I don't feel like preaching this morning. I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost up in here. I'm going to ask you, how many of y'all got Bibles? Hold them up where I can see them. Amen. Boy, we, we're doing good at Grace Church. We, we, we got our people with Bibles in their hands. But for those of you that may not have one, we're going to show you the scriptures on the above screen. If you will, open your Bibles up to Jeremiah 37. See, God wants you to have passion in your pursuit. But see, I'm talking to people that, that are actually pursuing God. And I, and I would like to think that you, as a member of this church, have, have got the, enough leadership in front of you that exhibits people that are trying to pursue God. See, th- th- there, there's a place where, you know, where only the pursuers of God can go. There's a place, it's called the inner sanctuary, the inner most holy place, where when you're really hungry for something greater than yourself, that you're able to enter into because you're pursuing him. Because you know there's no other way. See, listen, if you're going to be able to go through the big things, you got to remember the small things. you got to remember what he took you through. you got to remember how good he's been to you. you got to remember the times that you didn't think you were going to make it, and you made it to the next day. But see, see, mature Christians are going to be able to be passionate even if all hell is breaking loose. See, I'm going to tell you, man, I'm not giving the devil no glory, but let me tell you what, he has been fighting me this week, oh my goodness. Because he doesn't want to see you get free. Now, I'm going to start off with Jeremiah. Jeremiah, let me give you a little history on Jeremiah. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. He had a heart and a compassion for his people. Jerusalem is in captivity to the king of Babylon. The king of Babylon, the Babylonian empire at that time was massive. And Jerusalem had been taken captive. And Babylon had appointed other kings over Jerusalem at this time. Some of them were pretty brutal. Some of them were a little less brutal but they were brutal nonetheless. How many of you know sin will take you to a place that you don't want to go and keep you there longer than you want to be there? See, sin has a consequence. And what the Holy Ghost has been dealing with me about teaching the body of Christ is that we've been set free from the power of sin. And because we've been set free, hear me, church, because we've been set free from the power of sin, we've been set free from the clutches and the consequences of sin. See, if you're dead in Christ, why are you living like you're still alive in and of yourself?
Look at Jeremiah 37. We'll start with verse 1. And King Zedekiah, the son of Josea, reigned instead of Conaniah, the son of Jehoiakim, who Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made king in the land of Judah. But neither he nor his servants nor the people of the land did hearken unto the words of the Lord, which he spake by the prophet Jeremiah. Oh, Lord, we're not listening. And Zedekiah the king sent Jokul, the son of Shemaiah, and Zephaniah, the son of Messiah the priest, to the prophet of Jeremiah, saying, Pray now unto the Lord our God for us. You know, how many of us are always dependent on somebody else to pray for us? How come we're always going to somebody else and saying, Pray for me? Pray for me. You should have enough confidence as a Christian to be able to pray for yourself. You should be able to go into the presence of God and know that you've got total victory and that you have a right as a son and as a daughter of the Most High God to expect God, to anticipate God, to, to intervene in your situation. But we see here where, where sometimes, you know, I mean, if, if, have you ever been in a spot you just couldn't get yourself out of? Have you ever been in a place that caused you to become so desperate? You had no idea how in the world you're going to get out of it. I mean, have you ever been in a place that you were so stuck in that it broke you so hard, you didn't even know if you was going to wake up the next day? Have you ever been there? Are you there today? See, Captivity will always produce a tenacity. See, if you've never been bound up in nothing and you've never experienced the delivering power of God, then you probably don't even know what I'm talking about. See, I'm talking to people that have been bound up and been set free by the power of the Holy Ghost. By the redemptive work of the cross of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. So they, we see that the people are in captivity and they're growing tired of the oppression. So they go to Jeremiah and they say, pray for us. And this is amazing because this is what he says. Pray now for us. And Jeremiah came in and went out among the people for they had put him into prison. <laughs> Isn't it interesting? They went to the prison. They went to the place that the people thought that there was nobody there that was worth nothing. Oh, if not for the grace of God. That somebody was put away. Listen to me. What do you do with what's precious to you? You put it away somewhere where no one can get to it. See, let me tell you something. Every dark place isn't a bad place. Every dark place isn't meant to destroy you. Every dark place isn't meant to, to take your life. Sometimes a dark place is where God puts you to hide you. See, sometimes God puts you in a place you don't want to be in order to produce something in you that you may not even want. But once you receive it and once it takes birth on the inside of you, you realize how good it really is. <laughs> Isn't it amazing that they called for the man of God? And the man of God, the Bible says that he came in. You know, I would like to think that he came in and, and, and the atmosphere just shifted. I'd like to think that when he came in the room, devils were fleeing. I'd like to think the kingdom of darkness said, Uh-oh, here he comes. Look out, devil. Then Pharaoh's army was come forth out of Egypt when the Chal Chaldeans had besieged Jerusalem and heard tidings in them, they departed from Jerusalem. Listen, isn't it amazing how sometimes God will use the very enemy to bring your deliverance? Isn't it amazing how God will call what you once thought was bad and make it good? Isn't it amazing how God can take something that was so bad in your life and be able to turn it around and bring something good out of it? Isn't it amazing that the very thing that you thought was going to destroy you ended up destroying your enemy? Then came the word of the Lord unto the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, You shall say to the king of Judah that sent you unto me to inquire of me, Behold, Pharaoh's army, which has come forth to help you, 
shall return to Egypt into their own land. Listen, he didn't even need them. He sent them back. He said, I got this. I got this. Watch this. Now watch this. Watch what happens here. And the Chaldeans shall come again and fight against the city and take it and burn it with fire. Why? Because they refused to listen to the counsel of God. And then, deceive not yourself, said the Lord. The Chaldeans shall surely depart from us, for they shall not depart. See, sometimes you go to the wrong people and get the wrong advice and get bad results. And then you wonder why everything's jacked up. Because, see, you've got to go to the right place to get the right advice to get the right results. You've got to stop going to people that co-sign your stuff and start going to somebody that's going to call you on your stuff. For though you had smitten the whole army of the Chaldeans that fight against you, and there remained but wounded men among them, Yet should they rise every man in his tent and burn this city with fire. I want you to tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, the fight's not over. The fight's not over. The fight has just begun. But we already know who's got the victory. The church has got the victory because Jesus already conquered and got us the victory. See, I don't have to struggle every day because I already know who I am in him. And when I know who I am in him, my struggle's over, baby. I ain't got to keep struggling no more because I know the source of my life. And it's Jesus Christ. And he's already conquered everything on behalf of me. So all I got to do is start doing is declaring it, walking in it, and walk this thing out and start receiving the blessings of the cross of Jesus Christ. And stop living beneath my God-given potential and stand up and step out of that Put your foot on that water, baby, and start to walk across that water and say, I'm going to receive my blessing because I know that I have a right to as a son and a daughter of the Most High God. Hallelujah! Glory! We give you glory, Jesus. We bless your name. We thank you. We thank you. Bless your name. That's just the foundation. We ain't even started preaching yet. Go to Jeremiah 38. Jeremiah 38, just next chapter over. Then Shephatiah, the son of Matan, starting in verse 1, and Jedaliah, the son of Pasher, and Jukal, the son of Shemaliah, and Pasher, the son of Malachi, heard the words that Jeremiah had spoken unto all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, He that remains in the city shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. But he that goes forth to the Chaldeans shall live, for he shall have his life, for a prey and shall live. Listen. When you resist the word, you receive bad consequences. But isn't it interesting that he says, if you'll go into your captivity with gladness, I'll bless you. See, you've got to be able to hold on to your passion and in the midst of your pursuit. Because see, listen to me church, whatever you do in your place of waiting is going to determine the level of victory you get beyond it. I said that what you do during your time of waiting determines the level of breakthrough you get on the other side. See, I, I know you're going through some stuff. Praise the Lord that you're going through something that he counts you worthy to suffer for the kingdom of God. Listen to me. Listen to me. Just because you're a Christian doesn't negate you from participating in this thing called life. See, I hear a lot of people blaming God and the devil for a whole lot of stuff they have nothing to do with. It's you. It's your choices, your decisions. God ain't got nothing to do with it. The devil ain't got nothing to do with it. Take responsibility and say, the buck stops with me. Thus saith the Lord, he that remains in the city shall die by the sword. Verse 3, thus saith the Lord, this city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, who shall take it. Slap your neighbor and tell him it's not what it looks like. It's not what it looks like. Give him a high five. 
Tell your other neighbor, it's not what it looks like. It's not what it looks like, baby. It's not what it looks like. You know, it, it, just because you find yourself where you're at right now doesn't mean you're always going to be here because you've got to make a choice. Am I going to keep going forward or am I going to go backwards? Am I going to keep pre progressing or am I going to keep regressing? See, you've got to make a decision today, decide which direction you're going to go. But see, in order for you to have a direction, you've got to know where you're going for. You got to know where you're going. You got to have a place, a destination in mind. Otherwise, you're just like a GPS just wandering around somewhere trying to get somewhere. You don't even know where you're going. See, I got a GPS in my truck, and it just tells me where I'm at. It doesn't tell me where I'm going until I put a destination in there. But the minute I put a destination in there, it starts to tell me how to get there. Otherwise, I'm just wandering around, and the GPS just following me around. You know, it's interesting because when sometimes when you hear the truth, it hurts so much, you say, I just need to get somebody that's going to tickle my ears. I mean, I just got to find somebody that's willing to just, just get in agreement with my stuff because it's comfortable for me. And see, if you're going to go on to the greater things, you know, laying hands on the sick and resurrecting the dead, I mean, that's what we're called to do, isn't it? Isn't that what we're called to do? If, if, if we're called to set the captives free and we're bound up ourselves, how do we set the captives free? How do we do this thing? How do I keep my passion in the middle of my struggle? How do I keep my passion when all hell is breaking loose? How do I keep my passion for God when I don't even know if I can wake up tomorrow? How do I keep my passion for God when I've been praying for so long and I ain't seen no breakthrough? How do I keep my passion when I simply just don't have any? I want you to get on fire for God. Imagine what this room and, and live stream could do if, if we just get on fire for God. You know, we got to come out of our stuff and stop being so hypocritical of each other. Stop being critical and hypocritical in and of ourselves. We got to start loving each other. We got to accept each other right where we are. Because that's just where we're at. Yeah, have you ever heard the term, it is what it is? Now listen to this, verse 4. Therefore the prince said unto the king, We beseech thee, let this man be put to death. Oh my God, here comes the man of God out of the penitentiary, and they're all ready to, ready to kill him. They're already ready to kill him. For thus he weakeneth the hands of the men of war that remain in this city, and the hands of all the people, in speaking such words unto them. For this man seeks not the welfare of his people, but the hurt. Listen to me. <laughs> When you don't get in agreement with what the world says is acceptable, they're going to want to kill you. See, I, I, I don't care what the world thinks about me. I don't care who accepts me. I don't care what people say about me. The only one that I care about is what my master says about me because he's going to work all the rest out. And believe me when I tell you, don't touch God's anointed. You stepping up the wrong tree, baby, messing with God's anointed. So what do they do to this man? You know, we don't like what you're telling us. We don't like what you're saying to us. We don't like it because we are content being comfortable. We're content staying just the way we are. We're content with just going to church every Sunday and having no purpose and no calling in my local church. I mean, we're content not just telling anybody who we are in Christ. We're content keeping our gospel hid. We are content just being who we are right now. We're content. We're satisfied. I can't be satisfied with anything less than his totalness because I've tasted it and I love it. It's in, in, in a terminology of the streets, the guys say when something was wonderful, they'd go, it's lovely. 
it's lovely. Oh, you'll love it so much. Here, try some of this. It's lovely. I say, try some of that. It's lovely. Try some of this, baby. Then Zedekiah the king said, Behold, he is in your hand, for the king is not he that can do anything against you. Ooh, get in agreement with the people. Same, same, same. So they took Jeremiah, they cast him into the dungeon. Now listen to me now. This is just not your everyday prison here. This isn't with three hots and a cot and, you know, central air, central heat, you know, and they just recently started doing that in the last 10 or 15 years. Before that, they didn't even have heat or air. Um, and when they put you in the prison in Tennessee, they used to call it the green monster. That's what they would feed you. Especially if you were at the walls or at Old Fort Pillow, where I was once at, at Old Fort Pillow in Henning, Tennessee, in West Tennessee, back in 1989. And, and when you go to the hole, they feed you this thing. It's called the Green Monster. Ask me what it is. Thank you for asking. The Green Monster is the leftovers from two or three days. They put it in a blender, and they grind it up into like a slush. And they put it in a steel bowl and feed it to you like a dog through a slot in a door. That's what the hole was like back in those days. But this is what they did to Jeremiah. Isn't it interesting how things, some things just don't change? They took Jeremiah, cast him into the dungeon of Malachi, the son of Hamelech, that was in the court of the prison, and they let down Jeremiah with cords, and in the dungeon there was no water but mire, so Jeremiah sunk in the mire. Mire is like sewage. So it's almost like, you know that big culvert? I got a big culvert out back of my house. It, you know, because a couple years ago they made us move our fence back because they wanted to come drill it out or some crazy stuff. So. But anyway, there's, there's like this big culvert of water in sludge and it's just muddy and garbage floating down that thing. And that's what they put Jeremiah in. You know, a few days ago, I was your chosen guy. You know, a few days ago, you needed my help. A few days ago, you came and got me and pulled me out and said you wanted me to tell you something. And then when I tell you, you put me in a worse place. See, I want you to know that, that when you really stand for righteousness, some people ain't going to like you. See, isn't it amazing, though, that, that when they may not like you, but they come running to you the first time of trouble? Oh, I better go see the man of God or the woman of God and see what they got to say about this. Oh, but a few days ago, you, you, you don't like me. This is where humility comes in because we're called to those type of people. How do you keep your passion in your pursuit when all hell is breaking loose and you're sitting in a miry clay and, you know, and I, I, as I thought about this, as the Holy Spirit was dealing with me about this message today, I could just picture Jeremiah or even myself in this mud up to my neck. And, you know, when you're in this mire, it, it's probably like clay, which is what it says, and, it, and I probably can't move that well. So I'm probably stuck there, and I'm thinking, am I ever going to make it out of this situation? I mean, I'm trying to do the right thing here. I mean, I'm the man of God that they came and got that asked me for my advice, and when I gave it to them, they put me in a worse spot. Now I don't think I'm ever going to get out of my situation. Now I think I'm stuck here, and I don't know if God's able enough or big enough to get me out. See, you're starting to lose your passion. I mean, can you keep your passion in your darkest moment? I mean, can you keep holding on even when you're not seeing nothing? I mean, here he is, a man of God, God's chosen guy, and he's weeping for his people right in the midst of his captivity, and he can't even move. How frustrating must that be? There was no water but mire. Now when, <laughs> thank God that God has some people who are willing and obedient to do what he tells them to do. May that be us. 
Now when Abed, uh, Abedmelech, the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs, which was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon, the king then sitting in the gate of Benjamin. Abedmelech went forth out of the king's house and spoke to the king, saying, My lord, the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon, and he is like to die for hunger in the place where he, there is no more bread in the city. Uh, see, there are some situations, people, that you're going to have to encourage yourself there are some situations that you're going to have to find sustenance yourself. You know, Jesus said, I am the bread of life which came down from heaven. And I believe that this is probably an illustration of saying that I just don't feel God in my situation. Because as they said, it's a place of no bread. Not just physical food, but spiritual food. Where's God at? God, where are you? I thought we were friends. I thought you had my back. Where are you, God? I don't feel you. Why did you forsake me, God? You said you'd never leave me or forsake me, and I don't feel you, and I don't like it. I don't like this. I don't like this feeling that I'm having. And that's when he says, we walk by faith and not by sight. That's when he says, I promised you I would never leave you nor forsake you. And that's enough. That's when he says, when I was on the cross and I died for you and I was forsaken, I told my father that it's finished and I gave up the ghost. I want you to do the same thing. I want you to do the same thing. I'm not asking you for much. I'm not asking you for anything that I haven't already done for you. I'm not asking you for anything but total surrender. I'm not asking you but for everything that you are. I just want all of you, not part of you. I just want everything that you have. Give it to me, please, so I can give you more. So I can bless you. If you won't give it to me, I can't give you anything else but I need you to do it of your own free will. Not because I demand it, not because I expect it, because you love me as I love you. Revelation chapter 2, we're almost done. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Revelation chapter 2. You know, I'm one of them balanced preachers. I like to preach out of the old and the new. I've got three versions of the Bible in front of me right now. I've got the, because uh, I read all versions. My primary one's King James, but I like to read a lot of different versions because I like to break the word down. So I've got three of them. I'm, I'm going to kind of jump back and forth between the King James, the Amplified, and the CEV. Okay? And as I was meditating on this word, the CEV really jumped out at me, so I printed one of the pages off of it because I really wanted you to see what the, and it's just the scripture itself of what the CEV translate these scriptures into, okay? I'm going to read it to you out of the CEV. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. We can see where God is basically rewarding and rebuking the seven churches. He's telling them, it, 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 what I, it's called the positive-negative-positive principle. It, it, it's, a, it's a psychology principle that psychologists use to bring a correction to somebody, but, but also encourage them. And what you basically, the principle you use is you tell them something good, you tell them what they're doing bad, and then you tell them something good again, so they can leave encouraged, even though you just smack them around pretty good. You get that? Everybody following me? So this is kind of the principle that, that God uses when he inspired John to write these scriptures. And this is what he says. This is what you must write to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Now angel it really represents ministers. Represents the authority of Ephesus. Okay? And it says, I am the son who holds the seven stars in my right hand. And I walk among the seven gold lampstands. 
Listen to what I say. The seven stars represents the ministers of Christ, and the lampstands represents Christ's relationship within the church. Because in order to really get the concept of what the scripture's saying, I really want you to get it in context. Verse 2, I know everything you have done, including your hard work. Here comes the encouragement. And how you have endured, you kept your passion. I know you won't put up with anyone who is evil. When some people pretend to be apostles, you tested them and found out that they were liars. Verse 3, you have endured and gone through hard times because of me. And you have not given up. But I do have something against you. Here comes the rebuke. And it is this. You don't have as much love as you used to. See, when you lose your passion, you're going to lose your love. And why is that important, preacher? Why is it important that we keep our love? Because God is love. The less love, the less God, the less intervention, the less victory. Love is the critical element that sets the captives free. If you have not love, you have no substance to set others free. If you have not love, you're just a clanging symbol. You produce absolutely nothing. What a tragedy it would be when we leave this earth <clears throat> and those we left behind said, you know what? He produced nothing. See, that could be you right now. You may be thinking, you know what? I'm producing nothing. I've lost my passion. <clears throat> what separates the men from the boys and the, and the ladies from the girls is those that continually pursue <clears throat> even when they have no passion. Because, see, I remember a time when I was going through my struggle. <clears throat> the only thing that got me through it was the fact that I kept reading, praying, seeking, knocking, anyway. And God always came through. It was because of those moments of my decision to pursue him anyway that passion came back to life. That the passion, because listen to me, if you have no passion when you are tried, you will, you will fall apart. You'll fall apart. You'll start to depend on the doctor. You'll start to depend on the lawyer. You'll start to depend on the bank. you start to depend on the marriage counselor. You start depending on everybody but him. And this is what he said. Think about where you have fallen from and then turn back. Thank you, Holy Ghost. And do as you did at first. Hey, listen, if it worked for you once, it'll work for you again. Get back to the cross. And this is the promise. If you don't turn back, I will come and take away your lampstand. If you don't do what I'm telling you to do right now, you are going to die. That's how serious this thing is. We're not playing games. I mean, how many of you really understand that we are in a war? I mean, I mean, what's going on in Afghanistan and in Iraq and in, in, in Syria and in all those countries over there? You know, God bless America, God bless our soldiers. But that war is nothing compared to what's going on in the spirit right now for your soul for the souls of those that have not heard the gospel. The Bible says that hell is enlarging itself, making room for the more people that are descending into it every day. I mean, how does that make you feel as a Christian? How does that make you feel to know that, that your story and your testimony and your words could stop the hell from enlarging itself? Because, see, I, I'm tired of the devil taking things from me. 
I, I'm tired of seeing him taking things from people I care about. I, I, I'm just tired. I'm tired. And this is what he says, but verse, uh, uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 6. He said, but there is one thing that you're doing right. Now here comes the encouragement. You hate what the Nicolaitans are doing, and so do I. Which was idolatry, fornication. They were just living all kinds of ways. They were just doing it up big in, in, the, real, in, in the world tongue. They were doing it up big. I'm going to do it big, baby. Well, let me know how that works for you. In verse 7, he said, If you have ears, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. I will let everyone who wins the victory. I said, I will let everyone who wins the victory. Who wins the victory means there, there's, you got to do something here. Eat from the life-giving tree in God's wonderful garden. That means just partake in his presence. That means right in the middle of my stuff, I have the ability to enter into his presence and just it, with prayer and thanksgiving and say, thank you, Jesus, for how good you've been to me. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you brought me through. Thank you, Jesus, for setting me free. See, I, there's a place that we can go to that those that don't serve Jesus can go to. See, there's a place that only you can go to because it's your sanctity, your place, your sanctuary, where only you and him get down to business together. See, that's the place that your victory's at. See, that's the place you run to when all hell is breaking loose. That's the place when the devil tries to put depression on you. That's the place you go to when he tries to put sickness on you. That's the place you go to when you're ready to give up. You say, no, devil, you're a liar. I'm going to that place where I fell in love with my Lord. And I'm going back to where he said I, I lost him at. And I'm going to go back there and I'm going to sit down until he shows up and shows out. Because I can't do this in my own strength anymore. Because I know that he loves me. And because he loves me, he's going to bless my socks off. Listen to this church. Listen to the spirit, church. Listen to the Spirit. And this is what he says. I'm almost done. Just four scriptures and I'll be done. I've got a couple minutes. This is what you must write to the angel of the church in Smyrna. I am the first and the last. I died, but now I'm alive. Listen to what I say. Listen, the words that I spoke when I was alive ain't got nothing on the words I'm speaking now that I'm dead. They got power. My words are containers of power. I know how much you suffer. And I know how poor you are. But you are rich. I also know the cruel things being said about you by people who claim to be Jews, who claim to be your friends, who claim to be your family, who claim to be in your church as part of your family, who claim to love you, who claim to be fellowship with you, who claim to be all that with you. I know how much you hurt. But they are not really your family. They are a group that belongs to Satan. How much love are you walking in? God help us. May you never say that I belong to Satan. Don't worry about what you will suffer. The devil will throw some of you into jail. And you will be tested and made to suffer 10 days. That word 10 right there means number of completion after a test or trial. But if you are faithful until you die, I will reward you with a glorious life. You keep your passion by remembering your destination. You keep your passion by remembering what you're waiting for, darling. What's coming your way. And listen, you don't have to wait to get to heaven to enjoy the benefits of the gospel. You can do it right now. And finally, this is what he said. If you have ears, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Whoever wins the victory. 
will not be hurt by the second death. Death is coming. It's assured that we will all die and then the judgment. I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads. And this is the moment of truth, everybody. This is where we got to start really get serious with God and say, the preacher man was talking about me. This is where we get serious and we dig in and we say, you know what? I, w- I need more than what I've got right now. If that's you, will you p- put your hand in there? I see your hands. If you say, if you say, Terry, listen, man, you know, um, I, I, I know the Lord and I know he loves me and I know he's working in my life and but I'm scared. I'm afraid to tell people I'm scared because I just don't know what's going to happen. I've made some bad decisions. I've done some bad things, but I'm just not sure how it's all going to work out. If that's you, would you lift your hand in there? Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. You can put them down. Let's just pray. Father, Lord, we love you. We bless your name. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit that you sent to live on the inside of us because you didn't leave us without the power to fulfill what you've called us to do. <clears throat> and Lord, we just lay down our cares right now at the altar and we say, Lord, we, we, we've messed things up and we're asking you to fix it for us. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see what your spirit is saying unto the churches so that we can live this life out in total victory. I repent of everything that I have done up to this point in my life and ask you to forgive me and ask you, God, to use me mightily for the kingdom of God because I want to be hungry to set the captives free. And thank you for my leadership that continually to pour into me and help me to become better at what you want me to do. And I just lift up my voice right now and say, I bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and in Jesus' name. And I also pray for your families and those that are within the sound of my voice on live stream that may say, you know what? I want to know Jesus as my Savior, and I want something greater than myself. To you, I say, seek his face. Pray this prayer. Father, I lay down my life at the altar, and I know that you came and died for my sins on the cross of Calvary. And by faith, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. And from this day forward, I promise and agree that I will live for you all the days of my life. Send people to disciple me and teach me your word so that I can do it effectively. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.